Sam, what the hell's going on? Hey, buddy. It's good to what see you. What the hell is going on? I just got back from New Jersey during the worst weather that they've ever had on record. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I flew straight into it. Like, like Noah would have been. Noah would have been like, "Give me a raincoat, bro. I'm uh, I'm not good with it. Seriously, I don't, we're not covered on this one. Seriously, no. I mean, I, I think I've been to New Jersey probably three times in my entire life, and I haven't traveled in probably a year and a half. And so I happened to travel to New Jersey on the single worst day of New Jersey weather history. And we barely we we barely made it back to the hotel. We were driving through about Truly, two. By the way, no, no, that's not just you're not just saying that. It's really I'm not saying I'm not just saying that. No, no, we were we were white knuckling it on the return, white knuckling it on the way back to the hotel, which is only about ten minutes from the restaurant where we ate at. And so this there was this this event to to honor my presence because I was there to do a keynote speech and do a lead a breathwork event. So we yay, have about yay for you. Yay for you, you, my partner. Thank Very you. beautiful. Thank yep. you. So we have about 15 people at this, you know, all these important people at this event. And, uh, you know, people are sharing their speeches and this and that. And uh, we keep on getting these al- emergency alerts on our phones. Brr, brr. You know, we're looking at our phones like, fuck off. Come on. You know, putting the phone back down. Like, okay, can we... Sil- we can't silence that, can we? I, that's right. that's just so annoying. How irritating that they're ups- that they're you know they're interrupting our nice dinner here, where everyone is giving all these speeches. Well, the first person goes to leave. They open up the door, and they come back in in a second and go, "That's the craziest weather I have ever seen." Hmm. And so I go outside. I open up the door. And it is literally, it feels like you're an ant having a pitcher of water poured on top of you. I mean, mm. I have never experienced rain, anything like that. And we drove mm. through about two feet of water to the hotel, to the Hilton Hotel, trees down on the road, cop cars cutting off the entrance to certain highways. And I'm starting to think, okay, so I've got a wheelchair in the back of this car. Oh, yeah, and I have no plan about how if this car stops, which it could at any time, because we were driving this little you know Nissan through two feet of water. All the cars around, if one of the cars in front of us had stopped, we would have certainly stopped too. And so, you know, we're just white knuckling it. And I thought, okay, well, this this uh, this may be a very interesting night. So fortunately. I got back to the hotel. Now, some of the other people in the dinner party who were with me didn't. They, I mean, they they left to go home. Some of them had to be rescued at 3.30 or 4 a.m. after literally leaving their cars, abandoning their cars that were no longer running, swimming to safety, and then being picked up by family and friends at 3.30, 4 a.m. One of the guys lived in Connecticut it took him 12 hours to make it home. He made it home at 10 a.m. the next day after leaving at 10 p.m. the night before. It's crazy. Man. So anyway, I was glad that my part of this was, uh, you know, that I I got I got out of it early before it got too bad. But I felt like that felt bad for all the people involved. And you know, in you know, in the world of uh, the show must go on, as well as in the world of. Um, this too shall pass. It, 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 the show went on, and you're back in Ohio, right? I mean, and I'm back how- in Ohio. I'm safe and sound. You know, now we can just, uh, you know, speaking of, we have the absolute opposite of water here where I live in Ohio. We haven't had any mm-hmm. water fall out of the sky in years. Mm-hmm. So we could use a little bit of that water, not that much, yeah. because we would have uh, yeah. some pretty intense landslides, but we could use a little. How you doing, Fred? Yeah. What's going on with you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I uh, we we're up to lots of good stuff. I'm opening up all sorts of new products. I actually have this uh, podcast product that I can't wait to share with you. Uh, it's uh, teaching and being a source for people who don't have podcasts who want to have podcasts and actually nice. human humanizing it. You know what I'm saying is not necessarily being the guy who helps them find hardware, software, and 
uh, you know, proper platforms, but really, uh, 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 really getting people to truly get their voice and then, um, you know, build their tribe and then, and then create a legacy via podcasting, which as I see it is one of the remaining vestiges of a space where one can re- be, you know, really reliably and freely self-expressed. And, since those seem to be going further and further away, and many people think think that you know starting a podcast is too complex or they're you know not techno savvy or too much time or maybe they'll lose money or don't know how to do it. Um, you and I have put together a pretty good product here, and welcome to humanity is a pretty good product, and so the opportunity really to coach people into finding their voice. Uh, building their tribe and, and creating a legacy is is a little bit what I'm up to. So I'm excited about that. I've had some Beautiful. good conversations with that. Yeah. Beautiful. And then, uh, you know, other things are going on too. There's uh, a lot of reaching out, a lot of conversations. I have this new computer and new lighting and, you know, new microphone. Like I'm actually almost professional now. I got to do something about my attitude. That should, that should be the name of your book, Almost Professional Now. Well, like it's that. the attitude. When you write it's, your memoir, almost professional now, and then the subtitle can be, it's just the attitude that needs help. That's exactly right. And, and it, <laughs> I'm thinking it's a, I'm thinking with a crash course, we could do my attitude thing in about somewhere between three days and, and 30 years. Okay. Think, yeah. Okay. Right now I got it. I got it. It's it, depending on the deep dive I want to do, how deep I want to go cut as far as like changing my attitude. Yeah. I think I could do a little bit of this shit in three days. Well, you know, three- one of the things that I really appreciate about you is no matter how expanded and intelligent and conscious and amazing you become and you you explore all these different dimensions of consciousness mm-hmm. and it's just yeah. absolutely incredible. And then you come back to being the same old asshole that you always have been. And that's one of the yeah. things I really love about you. I really, I couldn't thank you enough for acknowledging the truth there. I really yeah. do appreciate it. There's something yeah. really warming and grounding about that level of acknowledgement. It's fully appreciated. <laughs> thank you. Really do appreciate that. All right. Who's our guest today? I don't know. We got some dude from metal. You know, I've actually done some betting on him the other three or four or five times that we dropped the ball and trying to set him up here. And so I, I, I barely remember the things I learned each time I went in at a different angle, learned a little bit, then I forgot, learned a little bit more, then I forgot, learned a little bit more, then I forgot. And so now I just have him mixed up with all the other metal dudes. I have no idea who this guy is at all. He's something to do with music. And, and he's most of the people music. listening to this are like, what the fuck is metal? You know, and here, oh, here yeah, they metal. hear music and metal. So they're probably thinking Slayer or something yeah. like that. They're like, <laughs> okay. Someone right, from yeah. Slayer is is the guest. Not exactly. Not exactly. Not exactly. What we got here, we got it. We got a rock. We did. Well, oh, we're back to having a true rock star here. We have had some rock stars on the show, but uh, Barry, uh, Goldstein is a, a member of that very elite club of men and people that we know that is making a real difference in the entertainment and music world and, you know, all, elsewhere as well, sound world, I think. And I'm loving, I can't wait to meet Barry and maybe share him with our listeners some of the things that make this man's heart sing. You know, he's got this cool wife you guys have been talking about too. I can't wait to meet her. But anyways. You know, and something that I really appreciate about Barry being a musician myself is there has been a, a movement in Barry's professional life away from creating music simply for entertainment and a movement to creating music for a deeper purpose, mm-hmm. for really helping healing and connection. And, you know, it's really easy as a musician to, and especially I think as a producer and someone who needs to make money in this world, to focus on the entertainment part of it and what sells and what, what's an easy sell. And I think it takes a tremendous amount of courage, not only courage, but talent and connection and spiritual connection to move in the direction that Barry has and not only move in that direction, but really create mastery in that craft and now work with some of the most extraordinary healers out there. Dr. Joe Dispenza, Greg Braden, Michael Beckwith, some of these real, you know, the, the, the names in mm-hmm. the healing world. Mm-hmm. And now Barry is creating the soundtrack to the lives that we are, are, we are the people that we're so familiar with. So rather than us continuing to talk about him, let's talk with him. Welcome, Barry. Yeah, welcome, Barry. It's great to have you here. 
Thanks, guys, for having me. I really uh, I appreciate being here with both of you. I'm excited to to uh, to talk with you. Well, what is this that Sam's talking about that has you being sort of an avant-garde musician out there doing stuff with, you know, creative healers and stuff? I'm so curious. Say more about that. Well, how'd you get there and what are you doing? Yeah, I mean, just a little a little bit of background. My background is as a, a traditional music producer. And you guys were talking about the East Coast. I'm from the East Coast, native New Yorker, and, you know, was a, a music producer in New York, a club kid, did a lot of hip hop, a lot of club music. And really got burnt out on uh, the music business per se of, you know, creating a four minute song in about 100 hours of studio time. So um, I decided to do some experimenting to kind of get back to my own heart with music. And the experiment was, well, what would happen if I didn't think about what I was composing, but allowed the music to come through me? Mm. And instead of composing, started the decomposing process. So mm, initially, for my own anxiety, my own stresses, my own sleeping challenges, you know, not thinking anyone's going to listen to hour long pieces of, you know, music with no melody. And basically, I was composing at 60 beats per minute, targeting my heart at a relaxed state. Mm. And um, I started going into these deep meditative states in the compositional process. And um, began to share that music. And um, we started getting testimonials of how that music was working. I'm giving you guys a short version here. And that led to my curiosity and research behind what was the mechanism of why this music was working for people in hospitals and hospices, delivering children into the world and dental offices. And, and uh, studying more about that and expanding as I studied and collaborating as I studied. And that's really a, a, a large part of the story was I was an experiment on myself and a success in getting myself there, which led to helping others with this. That's really, really, really fascinating. I, I you know, uh, Sam can attest to this and maybe, maybe you, you as well, but you know, there's in uh, expansion of consciousness using plant medicines or laboratory medicines such as ketamine, LSD, or some of the some of the plant allies that we all know about or at least know of in, in ayahuasca or or the uh, iboga or even like the uh, psilocybin or cannabis or any of the true plant medicines. There's often during the uh, assisted therapy part of it, during the part that is associated with what used to be psychiatry before psychiatry became so thoroughly and totally corrupt. I, I hope that we can, I hope that we can edit that out of this. By the <laughs> I had to say it, but I didn't realize that it was actually on tape. So you guys wouldn't mind if we cross that part. Uh, well, good. <laughs> All right. And so, so, you know, you, anyways, we're looking at that thing. There is frequently a playlist that is associated with each and every, uh, you know, medicine or drug experience. So uh, where the frequency of the, the baseline backdrop frequency is consistent with a frequency that calls for greater consciousness expansion, supposedly like a resonating, uh, frequency that allows for ex exploration into one's psyche, one's mind, one's ontological experience, et cetera, that supposedly would not be available if I was listening to, you know, Zeppelin or, or uh, Lawrence Welk. You know, there would be an opportunity for me to listen to Zeppelin or Lawrence Welk or whoever. But in this case, you know, like MDMA and Enya, you know, so I've heard that combination before, you know, like there's a, there, there's a certain rock or a certain vibration or frequency that is, seems to be consistent with the range that becomes available when one goes exploring consciousness. Now, what I'd really like to do is leave this to you now, if I've given you enough information, am I onto something close to what it is that you're addressing uh, or is that, am I just off base? In which case, just disregard my question. Yeah. I mean, I think it's always about resonance and, you know, finding what resonates with us usually takes us to those places. You know, the question becomes, you know, is there a unified frequency that is going to make all of us, you know, resonate or a specific frequency that's going to get you there. And in my opinion, you know, I think, um, in, in, 
my community, which is, you know, the sound healing community or the alternative health or healing, I think we're, we can be guilty um, just as, as much so as in the medical community where we're looking for a panacea or something that's a one size fits all that's going to be a, a prescription that's going to get us all there. You know, for instance, 4, 432 is going to get you there or 528 is the frequency of love, you know, or whatever it is. I'm not saying that people don't have valid experiences with this, but I think it, it can be tend to be oversimplified as well. And I think that it's it's a, a combination of where you're at in that moment where you're looking to go to that state. Mm -hmm. um, and also it goes beyond just a specific frequency, but my belief is that intention is also a part of it. My intention, when I step into the recording studio and I'm sitting behind that keyboard, are my emotions also recorded in that piece of music? Are you feeling what I'm feeling as it's going in? Does that have an effect on the listener in terms of their path? That sounds like Peter Frampton that, that, you know, do you, do you feel like I feel, you know, that song, you know what I'm talking about? I know very well. I grew, I was nurtured on that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just wanted, I just wanted to reference the fact that I have a little rock and roll in my history. Just to I got a lot of rock and roll history. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I worked with Les Paul, the guy who invented the Les solid Paul. body electric guitar Holy and was shit. part of uh, a Grammy award-winning track with him. So that, that guitar my, behind there, my dad got me when I was 14. So I wasn't I was, intending on- I would have known that. I would have been treating you with way more respect up until this point than I have. <laughs> you can excuse me. Shit, I had no idea you hung out with, or you like work with Les Paul, man. Sam, you guys let you me know, know when we got real icons on the show, so I could be a little bit more respectful. You know, well, I'm going to circle back to where you guys started, which was that, you know, I, I still go back and return to that um, Bronx guy, that asshole who grew up in the Bronx. So no matter how far we are in consciousness, Bronx Barry rears his ugly head every once in a while. And yeah. the kid who worked at Yankee Stadium, you know, in uh, 40 degree weather during the end of the World Series. And well, yeah, How old are you, Barry? I am. Um, I just turned sixty in March. So. I thought. I thought you were about that. Okay. Cool. Cool. So yeah. anyway, circling back to that though, I, I think it's a unique recipe that gets people to that state, you know, where they're open to a healing experience. It's not a one size fits all, you know, and it's also about the composition because I can use technologies, binaural beats, isochronic tones, all of these things that are supposed to balance our brain and our brain waves. But if you don't like the composition yourself. You know, and it, it's, you know, it doesn't resonate with you. You're not going to get there, you know. So it's a unique combination of what I call musical prescriptions, you know, that, that get people to different places at different times. And it's not a one size fits all. Sam, talk to me a little bit about what you're hearing, because that's just real, the, the first person that comes to mind, even if you wouldn't be the co-host, when he says, if you don't like your composition, you're just not going to get, if you don't like your own Impro improvised composition or even design composi composition, you're not going to get there. It's not going to be deliverable. The actual essence of the intention is a requirement in order to get the self-expression over here to the other side, the receivers. I notice when you're playing guitar, especially on your, you know, on your Facebook hit me ups, you know, like all of a sudden you pick up a guitar for seven and a half minutes, that there's, there is a sense that you are bringing your, heart and soul through that machine is can you speak to a little bit about this idea of intention versus you know playing covers just to just to buy time or whatever oh i would love to i mean th there's there's just so much to dive in here with and i don't even really know where to start but uh, you know, this is interesting because I was just having a conversation just before we got on today that was really related to this and about, it was really about the spirit of music versus music that is coming from a personal place. And, um, and what I mean by that is that music seems to, in a certain way, it, it, it is such a language of its own. And it's you, for me, I can easily detect when I feel as though a, a piece of music has been written with an agenda in mind. 
when there's some sort of personal sort of thing, well, this will sound good and my audience will like this. And now I'm going to write this because I want to write a piece of music that the audience will like. And then maybe I'll be famous or, you know, whatever. I'm being mm-hmm. a little bit derogatory and, and, like, and, and in order judge, to judgmental in my in my in delivery, but but for, you know, kind of for a good reason. But then there's music as sort of an entity of its own. And when I play, I try to express from that musical entity. And I say, what does the music want to say? Mm-hmm. And how is, what can I do to get out of the way with my own personal agenda, if I have one, and just let the music speak freely through? And my sense is that's the way to create from that deeper place where someone says, wow, I can feel that. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Oh man, like, damn, Mm. that really resonates. That's got soul. And Mm. there's, that's got heart and soul. And my sense is, I mean, we can, I'd love to pick your brain about this, Barry, because I think that you have a lot of knowledge and wisdom about this, that, uh, you know, one of the few people in the world who really has the type of knowledge and wisdom to speak to this, but there's a universal connection that is kind of how we describe soul. When music has soul, it kind of says, you know, um, I'm not B.B. King. I never have had the experience of B.B. King. I am not the grandchild of, you know, slaves or whatever, but I can feel that deep inside of me as though that is the way that my soul would express itself, even Mm -hmm. though our lives have nothing in common. So that's kind of what's, uh, up for me right now is, as I think about this, is the way in which there is this beautiful, beautiful sort of intelligence, consciousness, entity. It's this infinite dynamic, infinite sort of dimension that we call music. And the question is, how are we using it? What are we doing with it as musicians, as producers, et cetera? So I'd love to just hear you riff on that, Barry. Yeah, I, I think it's in addition, it's not just how we're using it, but it's how are we accessing it, you know, that unlimited feel that we're that we're talking about. I mean, for, for me, a big thing that changed my whole perception of this, <laughs> I'll share a story with you. We were talking about beforehand, Fred, that it's uh, you know, that it's it's a holiday, Jewish holiday coming up. And so I was born, uh, I was raised as in a traditional Jewish you know, tradition of the religion, but I really didn't feel a connection to the organized religion part of it. So for many years, I thought I was agnostic because my father thought that he was agnostic. And then I had an experience. I was actually on a train coming back from Fishkill, New York. I was taking a nap after a a weekend with a bunch of friends. And when I woke up uh, on the Wallkill river, there was a beam of sunlight that just kind of came through and shot through me. And in that moment, I felt that I wasn't agnostic anymore, that I just knew there was something beyond myself. And not too long after that, I was embarking on creating a a singer-songwriter album called The Moment, that uh, my background is as a singer-songwriter. And I had a dream And in this dream, uh, I received a song. And the song was called uh, Through the Eyes of God. And I was actually shown in this dream that um, we are all connected through a web of oneness. And I know it sounds very cliche and very woo and very new agey, but I was in this dream as a blade of grass. And in, in this dream, at the same time I was a blade of grass, I was also the the clouds. I was the rain. I was everything. I could see how everything was affecting me. And at the same time, I received these words. Through the eyes of God, I have learned to see that I am everything and everything is me. And through the breath of God, I have learned to breathe and I am everything and everything is me. And I woke up and I wrote these words down on a piece of paper and I had a melody that felt like I had heard this melody like many times before, you know, in, in previous times. And it wasn't, it wasn't anything that I experienced in this, in this lifetime. 
And when I woke up, I looked at the pad and pen and I was reading in the, through the eyes of God, through the breath of God. And I'm like, you know, to a guy who was b- brought up uh, and di- was agnostic, you know, I was being triggered by this, by what was on the paper. I said, this is a great song, but it's not going on my album. And the voice I heard back was, no, this song is your album. Mm. And so I kept trying to rewrite the song instead of through the eyes of God. I wrote through the eyes of the universe, through the eyes of love. I was wrestling, you know, with myself. Through the eyes of of my dog. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Which is my God as well. Uh, So anyway, I wrestled with it and I came back and said, you know what? It doesn't matter what I call it because it's all about what I'm connecting to. And in that moment where I wrote the song and I shared it in public and I put that album out, something changed for me in everything I knew about music and everything about writing music and intention and everything else. Because what I realized was that I could connect to that same field that I did in the dream and have these divine collaborations where I was connecting to something beyond myself and bringing it through for myself first, initially for my own healing experience, and then rippling out into others. And from then, I I never created the same again. And I have to tell you that I very rarely have creative blocks. Because if I have a creative block, I know that I'm thinking that I'm writing the song myself. And that if I shift my perception and my awareness in that creative block and say, I'm connecting to something beyond myself, I'm, cre- I'm connecting to the creator of everything. And in that awareness, I know that that creator never has creative blocks. Look all around you. Look in a flower, look in the ocean, look in anything you want, and you'll see there are no creative blocks within the creator. If I set the intention of creating with Have you that, ever seen a warthog? Because I think there was, I think there really, I think there have been some blocks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in that you could probably find some beauty in there somewhere. You have yeah. to work at that. I mean, there's some blips where he was sneezed or had to take a pee or something. Because <laughs> there are, there's little things where you're like, dude, that, that didn't work out in the same way level as the rest of the universe yeah you know? but can we agree that's a, probably a small percentage yeah I'm, i'll give you that i'll give you that i just can't go with no creative blocks i just <laughs> i just or two and then out comes a warthog and he forgot to erase it or something or maybe the color <laughs> the certain color of green was created within that, <laughs> that uh, you know this so, is a but, totally but anyway, if that's, totally that's, random question oh sorry you're gonna finish and i'm about to interrupt you go ahead I mean, that's the main point for me. And that's what changed things from creating music as art and entertainment, where we're basically pleasing ourselves in the process. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I've had amazing experiences and and in that perception. But if you're looking at it as altering your state of awareness in the process and getting to those places that you're talking about on some of those journeys, you know, that you're that that people are going through to connect with their spirituality and What if there's also another chapter of that where what if they could just connect through the music and get to that same place as well and getting to that altered state through it? And I've been there where I've been in altered states just from that connection itself and connecting to to that vastness. So that's the whole point. You know, it's and and this is not just for music. This is it's a way of life in everything you do. You have a business plan, you know, connect to connect to the creator to help bring that in. It's walking with that, you know, energy. So, in everything that you do. so I want to, I want to dive into a little, I, I so understand what you're talking about. And I also know that there's going to be people listening to this who are like, what does that even look like? What, how does that even, in fact, even some musicians I've known, classically trained musicians who have dedicated their lives to classical music for decades and who play exquisitely classically, but they require 
that sheet music in front of them. They require that music to be able to interpret those notes and follow along with what it says to do, take those orders, read that with their left brain, and then use their right brain to be able to as, uh, express that as well as they possibly can. And the thought of improvising is a total, like a total foreign language to them. In fact, I, I, I worked with a classically trained violinist years ago to help her to learn how to improvise. And we started with the very basics, just three notes, playing three notes in different orientations with different phrasing. And it was a whole other thing for her. So how? People are going to want to know how. How do you access this space that is exquisite and where you are letting yourself be essentially a channel or a vessel for the creator with your music? Is there a particular practice that you have in terms of putting yourself in that space? Do you have a meditation practice? Do you have a prayer practice? Or do you just go up to your gear and start massaging the keys and see what comes out? How does that work for you? What does it look like? Yeah, I mean, sound definitely inspires me. You know, just like an artist, you know, if you had one color in front of you and you were trying to, you know, to connect to this same space I am with just the color red, you might find it more challenging than having a whole palette of colors, you know, initially to spark that inspiration. So for me, having different sounds and, you know, accumulating libraries of sound and creating my own sounds and, you know, working with different tunings on on things as well so that I'm I don't always know what I'm doing you know in the pursuit of of looking for something is what inspires me and so I could start with one sound and just start going a lot of different places with it just like an artist would with you know you put that you put that brush down and you start painting and you just you start going with it. If you start thinking about what you're necessarily going to do, you're not going to connect to that same level of freedom. And it's with music, as you said, Sam, it's a left and right brain thing, you know? So for a lot of us, you know, we're trying to let go of some of that analytical aspect and more tap into the part that's not analytical. And that's why, you know, we're a, a lot of buzzwords that are going on now within the field are heart and brain coherence and the heart's intelligence and the mind's intelligence. So we're kind of looking to find a balance between really connecting to our hearts in the process where you said, wow, I could feel that in my heart, right, during that process. So if I hit a key, you know, and wow, I like that. But then all of a sudden I hit a, harm, a harmony with that or something else. And like, wow, I could really feel something opening up with that. Then I, you know, further explore that and just keep working with that. Just like an artist creates layers on that canvas. And what he starts out with is usually what he doesn't end up with. It doesn't look anything like what he started with. But I think most of us have hit a place where we've had these experiences where we are, we are nowhere, you know, we, we, the, the thinking mind stops. Yeah. That's pretty much all day for me. Yeah. And a lot of men can actually do that, right? We can, men can do that. And they actually have studied this when men say we're thinking of nothing. We actually are thinking of nothing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no, I'm not, but I'm, I think that I'm we, actually thinking of the woman next door, but I, I tell them that I'm thinking of nothing, you know, I'm not gonna, <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. But it's something, but it's nothing within that. It's something within that nothing. But yeah. I think we've hit that. Like my mother used to move to meditative states and not know it while she was washing the dishes. You know, I used to see her at like daydreaming and yeah. say, wow, mom, you look like you're in a deep place. What were you thinking about? And she would say, oh, I don't even remember. I was just drifting. Yeah. So if we can have a, a, even an experience like that for 20 seconds, then now you have an anchor to be able to know what that feels like. Yeah. And that's really all you need. You need a starting point, you know, to, to feel something so you can go back to it. And if you can reproduce that in some way, whether it's through music or art or not thinking or even speaking, then you have a place to go back to. Um, and that's, that's the starting point. 
It's really amazing as I hear both of you speaking, you know, my uh, opportunity in the other podcasts, the Welcome to Humanity podcast that I host has led me to multiple different, very highly talented artists, uh, dancers and uh, singers and musicians and um, body workers and, you know, people who uh, speak openly. They're, they're, you know, spectacularly accomplished. And this particular theme of kind of getting myself out of the way, which is what Sam actually said earlier in this particular meeting, you know, getting myself out of the way and sort of recognizing that the best I can hope for is to be a vessel of what the creator is sending through me, you know, to the world on the other side, you know, to the, like through me to the receivers, to uh, the recipients, to those that are likely to be touched or moved by my, uh, my so-called creative expression <clears throat> is constant. There's like a uniform regularity with the very fine artists. Like, oh no, you know, like when Sam says, look, I know exactly what you're talking about. I completely believe that Sam absolutely knows exactly what you're talking about. And there's something about giving up this maybe uh, ego or small self or whatever it is that they, has me think that I wrote that piece, you know, and, and uh, really just kind of grabbing on to the oneness of it all and ha and being grateful or honored or blessed with being the uh, the instrument or the vessel for which this particular art form can come through for some degree of exquisite expression. And that an artist like you seems to have tapped this at an even higher level, you know, really like really looking at the techno aspects of it, you know, what is the actual vibration? But at the same time, you said a line, I don't know if you've ever heard yourself say this, but you said, I don't always know what I'm doing in pursuit of looking for something. Mm -hmm. That's really outrageous line. There's no, there's no meat to that bone at all. And I totally get it. It's like you're on your way to looking for something. You don't even know what you're looking for and you don't know what you're doing on your way to looking for it. And that's the way it's going right now. And then what gets created on that pathway is extraordinary. Yeah, well, you know, that's the essence of creation. And what, what to me has always ignited me is being able to create something from nothing, whether it's good or not good. It doesn't really matter in that moment because it's the actual act of creating something and birthing something that didn't exist, you know, an hour beforehand. And that now does. And, yeah. you know, and if you rewind things, you know, so to wrap your head around things, too, and for people who are listening, you know, I don't want to just get into just a what considered a woo conversation, because I do want to, you know, I, I do want to say that science is a language just like music is. And, you know, there's a science behind the creative aspects of it as well, you know, that you can tap into. It doesn't have to be either or. It's a bridge. You know, and science is catching up in some ways to spirituality. You know, things that we've known for thousands of years. I'll give you I'll give you an example, Fred, that you might find this interesting. And Sam, you might know this or not know it. You know, but for thousands of years, music's been used in in healing and in medicine. You know, and originally in the symbol of Chinese medicine, within that symbol is the symbol of music. So they recognize that music brings harmony to the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. So it's a it's a other conversation entirely when we're talking about healing, because most people think of healing as something that just happens to the physical body. But in reality, if you work with any of those physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual, and you have an, a, a place where you released a block in any of those, then something has changed within you. And that to me is the definition of healing where something shifted, you released a block of some kind, whether it's in a grieving process of hearing a song, you know, like when my mom died, one of her songs at her funeral was, um, was Chopin's Nocturne in E flat. And six months after she passed, I heard that song and literally released six months worth of grief that I was holding in my body in that one song. Mm. Is that healing? You know, releasing mm. that so. emotional energy. So I think it comes back to redefining what healing is. But they were doing this thousands of years ago when people were chanting OM, you know, and now we have studies 
that have shown that when we're chanting OM, it creates what's called limbic deactivation in the brain through fMRI studies. We're able to see that when we a group chanted S, nothing happened in the brain at all. But when another group chanted OM, that there was a, a area of the brain that was deactivated that normally deals with um, a, a threat. So when we feel safe and when we're we're feeling in a state of inner peace, that's when we limbic deactivation occurs. And that's what happened when they chanted OM. So we've known this for thousands of years, but when I'm speaking at medical conferences, and I want to know that I'm getting to the point where I want to get these doctors up and I want them to chant OM with me. I can't just get there from A to B. So giving them a study that says, hey, this is what happens when we chant OM, and this could be a great tool for you in your practice or dealing with patients to help them release anxiety or um, elements of PTSD, anything that's going to silence the mind. I said, here's a study. Are you now willing to stand up and chant OM with me? And I have 200 doctors standing up and, and chanting a chant that they call Om Shalom Home. Wow. So again, science is a language. And the same thing with drumming. You know, we're seeing in drumming circles, which have been, drums have been around in cultures for thousands of years, that um, they are increasing alpha brain waves in PTSD veterans. You know, they are helping people deal with anxiety and stress and connect more socially. And there's studies that show that. So the science helps us get there. So you can get corporate executives who walk into a drumming circle and pick up that drum because science says it's okay. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, one of the things that you're, you're making me think of is um, something that I frequently hear your partner and collaborator, Dr. Joe Dispenza, speak of. And that is the way in which the brain needs to have a logical understanding of something, an, an emotional and a logical connection to the subject matter before one is really open to a new experience. And, um, and that especially sounds like, men. you know, yeah, especially, especially men. men. Yeah. Yeah. And so that room full of doctors, they had to be convinced of the data, the science before they were willing to actually go there and have that new experience that otherwise they had sort of a rigid belief system, which would prevent them from be opening up to having that novel experience because there would be a, a feeling of vulnerability that they, we naturally have this instinct to protect ourselves against that which might be novel and unfamiliar. And, um, and Dispenza talks about that all the time, how the, a big part of his, the, why he lectures so much on the science and gets people to repeat the information that they are learning is so that they can understand it enough to silence that part of the mind that would otherwise filter and object to a novel experience, a novel and unfamiliar experience, so that they actually can potentially reprogram themselves with something that is new information. Yeah. And it's a, you know, it, we all want to feel safe when we're embarking upon uh, something new, you know, don't we? I mean, so if you're going into uncharted territories, you want to feel safe before you take that first step. So, and we have different types. We have different archetypes. People are different, you know? So those people who are deep into their analytical mind, you know, they want to hear that those, the science first, and that allows them to take the journey where they're feeling something more, you know, in their heart. And then you have people the other way around who are just in that compassionate state of receivership, you know, naturally and giving them the science takes them out of that and puts them into the analytical, you know, so it's all about, you know, utilizing music as a bridge is one of my, my biggest messages. And it's, it's a big part of my book because whatever, wherever you are, you have to ask yourself, and this is something for your listeners. If, if this is new to you and you want to start utilizing music on a daily basis beyond art and entertainment, because the, the, the most powerful thing you can do is create a program with it where you're utilizing music to for mood regulation and you're using it for energetic management in your day. But in order to do that, you, there has to be an awareness 
of being willing to look inside of where you presently are at. So that's the step one. If you ask yourself the question, where am I right now? What emotion am I in? And then you ask yourself, okay, well, that's where I am now. Where do I want to go? And then the third question is, what piece of music do I think is going to take me there? You know, so if you wake up and you're, um, you know, you're anxious and you're already feeling stressed in your day, you might want to listen to a piece of relaxing music to get you out of that. I started off by talking about music at 60 beats per minute. And then again, this is part of the science of how I got there initially was targeting my heart at a relaxed state at 60 beats per minute, because that's where our heart is at a relaxed state. So I set my metronome to 60 beats per minute. And this is what's called entrainment. Our heart, which is an internal mechanism or our metronome, internal metronome, has the ability to adapt to that tempo in music. And we can actually entrain and target specific heart rates and heart rate variability through that. So if I'm waking up anxious, I might want to listen to a piece of music at 60 beats per minute. But say, you know, you have a, a meeting and you're in a leadership role and you need to get up and, you know, or you need to boost your energy up. You know, you need to boost your mood. Maybe I listen to a piece of Sly and a Family Stone or no, no. I... You know, or I listen to something that inspires me. So it's not always just, you know, uh, relaxing music. It's it's asking yourself where you are, where do I want to go? Where do I want to get? How am I going to get there? What piece of music? And I mean, they're showing this in incredibly um, successful in with Alzheimer's patients, you know, as well in creating playlists that they used to love listening to before the Alzheimer's because it could actually regu help regulate mood and agitated behavior and actually access them, uh, access memories that are not normally available through those pathways through traditional language, but it is through the language of music. I'm left with a question here. So you, when you brought up Sly uh, and the Family Stone and, and I, I my mind went down. I think Sam knows the story about a, a concert I once attended with Sly, for Sly, you know, um, at the Michigan Palace in uh, probably 1975. Uh, Sly was coming to the Michigan Palace uh, for two nights and he showed up on the first night and, oh no, he didn't show up actually. The place, everyone else showed up. Everyone else, all of us showed up. The place got very, very smoky, very, very crowded. Uh, Tower of Power was leading in front of them. So nice. they were really great. And I never even heard them until then. And I've listened to them plenty since then, that having whatever vibrations they have in driving music in a certain way. That was quite a band, actually, Tower of Power. And um, and we waited for Sly and he never showed up. But he, dude never showed up. He never showed up. And so we have 4,500 people there, like just bumming out, you know? And so they uh, the Detroit made a a special rule and gave us general admission tickets for the next night. So that meant there would be 9,000 people in a place that held 4,500 people and we would be sharing seats and be standing room only. And we get to see Sly Stone on the second of two nights. He was apparently too high on the first night to make it into the, to the theater. So, uh, you know, the, the next night, that's exactly what happened. It was an overpacked theater is like no, nobody's business. It, we certainly ever, never, ever is going to happen again like that. But it happened then. It happened that evening. And it was a raucousy bit of fun that was unforgettable. You know, he showed up uh, mostly acoustically. When he walked onto the stage, he was who he was, you know, Sylvester. He was, he, he was pretty incredible, pretty beautiful. So I remember all the fun I used to have with music. And this was what, so the epitome of sheer, just sheer fun. Fuck utility. This wasn't about making Alzheimer's patients better. This wasn't about turning around PTSD. This wasn't about finding frequency so that we can bring peace to the universe. This was just flat out raucousy fun inside of some music that was driving me to straight fun. And straight fun in some ways has reached a point where maybe it's considered less valuable than utilitarian mm. usages of music. Like somehow, no, 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 this is real. This isn't just here to jack off next to you. This isn't just here to, you know, dance the hokey pokey with. This is 
actually utilitarian that's saving lives and it's turning around disease and it's, you know, like it's being science, scientized, you know, scientificized, mm. you know, there's something like in order for music to now be valuable, we have to give it some gravity in the world of technical clinicals or something. And that may, yeah. now I'm, I'm not really seeing that Barry, when I bring this up to you, I'm not seeing that you're doing or that it's not, certainly not that, but what about just the value of just straight, I can't believe how freaking awesome that was fun. You know, Zeppelin does bring that to me. There are some, yeah. Sam, Sam and I, you know, Jeff were talking, like sometimes Absolutely. I'll listen to shit and be like, dude, that is the most fun I've ever heard. You yeah, know, like that. yeah. I'm glad yeah, you're addressing good. this, Fred. This is good. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, no, I'm glad you're, you're talking about that. For me, there's no separation of that. And I'm, that's not what I'm saying at all, that it needs to be studied or validated through science for, for it to have an experience. My message is actually the opposite of that completely, because preferred music is one of the most healing ways to connect with music. When you're in that, when you're, so to scientize what you just even said, you know, so why are you in a state of joy during that process? You know, and why does music do that? You know, you probably don't care. And when you're in that place, you don't care. But what's going on is, you know, your music acts as a reward and pleasure center as well. And when you're in that place of joy, it is healing because your body is actually your your pharmacy in your body is producing hormones that are beneficial to you, including dopamine. You know, Mm -hmm. and your stress hormones are are being produced less like cortisol. And things like that. So it doesn't really matter to me how you get there. I'm not saying you have to, there's one way to get there. And a matter of fact, you know, in my book, I give playlists for people and most of them, you know, they're completely mixed up. My list, Fred, for gratitude, you know, in my morning to, to connect into gratitude is listening to um, Karen Drucker, who is kind of new age. Thank you for the song spirit, a, a piece of music I created called The Heart Codes. Sly and a Family Stone, thank you for letting me be myself. Thank you. Because that connects me to gratitude. Mm -hmm. Dido, thank you. Dido. Louis Armstrong, What a Wonderful Life. What a Wonderful Life. Okay, so that's my playlist. I love that, man. And so that's the message. It's like, it's not, okay, no, you have to listen to all relaxing music. It's like, what's going to get you there? And what's going to get you to a place where you're going to move into that enjoyment that you're talking about, why do we consider that enjoyment healing? Enjoyment yeah. is healing. When we laugh, we are healing. And yeah. that's the biggest message is that we're creating these dividing lines, you know, of saying, oh, well, this is scientifically valid, or this is music for beyond art and entertainment. You know, it's all, it's all good. You know, it's all good if it gets you there. The biggest shift is knowing that you're in in control of that and that you are basically steering your vessel and have the ability to manage your energy, utilizing it. And that's what I call becoming the DJ of your own life. You know, so yeah, you can have random experiences where that happens to you. Great. You have that, that happened to you where you listen to that Slime and Family song, song once in a month and you're like, man, why don't I listen to that song more? Good question. Why don't you? If you know that you're having that experience, why yeah. wouldn't you put that into a playlist for this mm-hmm. or put it into that and start creating these you know, musical prescriptions, which are low cost, non-invasive, no side effects, and start managing your emotions and create emotional mastery through the use of whatever music you want to use. Beautiful. Yeah. Well said. It's so important that we avoid creating some sort of standardization around things. Right. And I'm I'm thinking of the, the parallels with sort of psychedelic studies these days. And while I very much appreciate all of the great work that's coming out of clinical trials around psychedelics and psychedelic therapy, there's this, I think this notion that uh, psychedelics now must be relegated to a clinical environment with a blindfold on and headphones on. Otherwise, you're not doing them in a responsible manner or whatever. It's And it kind of brings along a sort of puritanical constraint. Mm-hmm. And I know for me, you know, I respect the intentionality of that. I don't, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I really respect the intentionality of that and the safety that that provides, especially when using these 
novel count compounds that can have these massive effects on your psyche. Yet at the same time, I grew up using psychedelics at raves and it was part, you know, or concerts. And am I looking back and judging those as bad experiences? Hell no. I had some great experiences. And there was something about the hedonic quality of those experiences that actually created such a powerful experience. Now, would I say to someone, you know, the first time you try psychedelics, go to a rave or a concert? I don't know. Maybe not, you know, especially if driving was involved. But I certainly don't want to devalue the experience of having something exciting that is hedonic. And I think that, you know, part of this, I'm, I'm just feeling the way in which there's such a tendency, Fred spoke to this, to sort of standardize things and make something right. sort of appropriate versus inappropriate. And yeah. I was talking with a fellow friend of ours recently who's a music therapist, and he was talking about when he went through his music therapy degree, it, they had to to uh, be able to perform an aria and perform a piece of Bach, and both of which are associated with the elite. You know, these are traditions that come from the aristocratic societies creating music for the elite. That was sort of the you know the if you can if you are invited into this music, this is a music by invitation only. If you are sophisticated enough to be able to hold space and appreciate this type of music, then you are of an elite class. And that means that there's actually an institutionalized standardization of a certain type of music that says, this is therapeutic, right. this is not. You know, to some people, Slayer might be therapeutic. You know, yeah, and, and, you know, research supports that again, you know, th that, you know, people who are in a psychotic states, you know, if you play a piece of relaxing music for them, it's not going to relax them because their brainwaves are moving so fast that they need something that is going to bridge that for them. So that Slayer might work better for a psychotic person. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think I think the main part for me is that it, I think it's by nature we're looking we look for panaceas. You know, mm -hmm. we look for, for cure-alls and it's easy. To and standardizations. Standardizations that, you know, and it's, it's, it's the same thing that we're accusing pharmaceutical companies of, you know, prescribing, you know, for, for one thing for everyone, as opposed to individualized medicine, medicine. And I think it's the same thing for music as well. It's individualized music is going to be the most powerful message for me is not just what to listen to. It's more important that you learn how to listen to music mm -hmm. and realizing that music isn't just something that happens to you, but it's something that happens in you. So when you're listening to a piece of music, and I think you described this, Sam, when you listen to something, you're like, wow, that piece of music really affected me. I could feel something going on in my heart or I felt a tingling sensation. You know, I felt chills up my spine during that song. You know, that's the awareness that that we need to adapt to is seeing how things affect us mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually when we're listening to a piece of music. And you can say, wow, when I listen to that, I feel expansive. So defining expansive. For me, expansive is, you know, sitting or standing on top of a mountain or feeling underneath a, a stars or feeling by the ocean. That's how that song makes me feel. Or, you know, it makes me feel contracted, even though my friend Sam recommended this piece of music. And he says, wow, you got to put this on with headphones. It has binaural beats. It has isochronic tones. It's going to take you somewhere. But for me, it felt like someone scratching their nails on the board or me being frozen on a winter's day. I just wanted to go like this. So if we can start to be our own, you know, recognizers of what resonates with us and say, no, I don't like that piece of music. That might be good for this person, but it's not good for me. Just like my doctor said, uh, or uh, someone said broccoli is going to be nutritional for me and it's going to be great to battle cancer. But I take it and I break out in hives, you know, because for me, it's creating inflammation. So I believe we can nourish ourselves with music as well. We can either feed ourselves and, and reach more expansive states with that. And that could be your sly in a family stone. 
or it could be a piece of Vivaldi. You know, who cares? Does it make you feel open and expansive or does it make you feel contracted? You know, so it's a how to listen. We don't we're not trained how to listen because we're we're so engaged in our minds and shutting shutting down that we're not engaging in how we can open up and let go. Barry, I, I really am. So, you have opened up so many different lines of potential places to go. So I think Sam referenced that earlier. There's so many different question lines that we could go to from here, but we only have a limited amount of time left. So I, I, um, I'm going to, I want to really, I'm so curious. I'm hoping that this resonates with both of you. Re- resonates is the name of the game after all. <clears throat> the other day, so one of the most amazing experiences that I'm going through in these present days is Spotify. Spotify, just straight up. It's just straight up. That whole experience is so insane for me. <laughs> I, I love it. It's like, if you're going to turn me into an automaton and continue to serve up the things that I love moment after moment by doing so, then maybe I could vote to continue to be a, a, an automaton. Like the music that Spotify serves up to me, the next song, after I think I've picked up the song I need to hear, like, oh, I want to see, I want to hear Can't You See, you know? So I I play Can't You See. And then, you know, what shows up next has everything to do with the conversations I've been having for the last 96 hours or everything to do, you know, not necessarily is it going to go to like Skinner or Almond Brothers, but it will go to, it could but it might go to the next song, like some sort of, I, I don't know, you know, Van Morrison. And it's just like, oh, yeah, that fits perfectly on the other side of Can't You See. And I and I needed to hear this song more than I needed to hear Can't You See. <laughs> so, the, so the artificial intelligence or whatever's going on inside of that algorithm of Spotify is totally creepy to me. And I'm I'm like a kid in a cradle, you know, I'm like. Bring me more, please. You know, it's like, how did you know that Emerson, Lake, and Palmer was what needed to come next? How did you know that Haydn needed to come next? Like, how did, what, did, what, what went into that decision? Because it's always way right in some sort of resonating, vibrational, personal satisfaction, hedonistic pleasure principle. Like, how the fuck did that happen? And what is your thought about AI and the future of music being delivered through Pandora, through Spotify, through these, you know, through these uh, uh, algorithms that are already know which song is going to make me do whatever, whatever is next to do? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a balance of technology and, you know, also preference, personal preference to it. But I, I think it's I think it's good, you know, personally, because I think there's more to choose from. It's in the same time, it's also turning you onto new music that you might yeah. like that yeah. you've never heard before. And I think that we should make use of the technology even more so. But I think where where it can become even more powerful, Fred, is if you then take those songs that you that they recommended to you and you create your own playlist of it. You say, wow, this made me feel this way. So I'm going to put that into a playlist for the middle of my day when my energy starts to run low. I'm going to use those 10 songs that Spotify just recommended so that I can get more energy. Or those relaxing songs, those are going to become my sleep songs. So James Taylor, Can't You See, you know, and Marshall Tucker's, you know, whatever. Wow, what if I bridge those from my busy day and start just kind of, you know, tailoring down my energy and slowing down and get to that point where I'm more relaxed. Yeah. That becomes even a tool where now you're using technology and you're also using what resonates with you. Yeah, and then choice. what would happen if you shared that playlist with Sam? Yeah. He goes, wow, that's really cool. You know what? I'm going to put three songs that I dig that I don't think you heard of into your afternoon playlist. Yeah. So it's it's a combination of AI, but it's also a combination of being intuitive yourself. Yeah. The other day, the same similar thing, a Spotify phenomena had Spotify serving me up 
I do really don't remember the cascade entirely, but I do remember a couple pieces of it, which was all of a sudden I was listening to inside, like inside Billy Joel. I was like way inside, you know, uh, Captain Jack and uh, a New York state of mind, like these things started happening. And it was like, Oh yeah, it's been a minute. It's been a minute. And I can see the picture that this man is drawing. Like I can follow the song or the words And when the thing is done, I'm looking up at like a Mona Lisa canvas of what Captain Jack really is. Like, oh, thanks for letting me hear it from 63 years old rather than when I was simply being, you know, getting stoned at 27 years old or something when I first heard it. You know, there is an opportunity. And then, oh, and then it switched me to Joan Baez, who I haven't listened to in in years. And it was like, oh, she is she is beyond phenomenal. I I didn't get that. I forgot that she's pre Carol King. I forgot that she actually ranks more with Ella and Louis than she does with anyone who's come after her. I forgot how flipping awesome Joan Baez is in her tonality, in her in her capacity, in her range. And so I was like plastered to my seat listening to this music, this this uh sirens music that was just riveting riveting you know songs that i know that we play by the by the campfire or something sometimes but with a voice that i didn't recall how beautiful no wonder my mom introduced me to joan baez when i was like six you know it's like uh this idea of being able to see music. So synesthesia, you know, Sam, you you referenced this, I think, a few days ago in, in some talk about, oh, in our Tuesday talk with uh, Ken. Uh, this idea of, be, you know, mixing senses. So mm-hmm. not just listening, right. but like seeing and feeling music. That's right. Uh, uh, talk to us a little bit about this wild woo-woo phenomena of synesthesia. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I recommend to people is a a really simple too. I call it like a five minute vacation. And I've used it a lot during the times that we're in where you're surrounded by the same environment all the time. You know, I'll put on a piece of music from a different piece of place in the world because the most powerful experience I feel we can have is one that's multi-century as you, as you, as you said. So when I close my eyes and I listen to a piece of uh, like music from Bob Marley, you know, and the, and the Wellers, I'm not just listening to Bob Marley. I'm going to Jamaica, right? I'm there. I can smell what's going on in that recording studio or by the ocean. Right. And I'm for five minutes, I'm out of my environment. Music transported me to someplace different. And I try to do that like once a day where I'm shifting out and taking a five minute vacation. You know, even if I'm listening to a piece of music from the Orient, because music's great. I lo- and sometimes music with no lyrics says the most, you know, because you can feel it in the, in the chord structures and go someplace else. So it's, again, when we find something, a powerful experience, I guess part of my nature is, yeah, I'm enjoying it and that's awesome. But how can I also use that to, to further my energy? So when you're in that place and you're listening to Joan Baez, Right. And you're listening to that set. And you, to me, when you were talking about that, you sounded really inspired. I was. I right. am. So that's you're in the perfect state. It's like, great. You're in this great energetic state. Now what? You know, what are you doing after you've listened to those songs? You know, it's a perfect time to write a chapter in your new book, you know, because you're open up, you know, this creative state where, you know, you're you're able something has bridged for you. So if you don't recognize that. And say, wow, yeah, I'm in a good mood. That's awesome. And then you just go back to, you know, five minutes later and you, you know, you're back where you were. Then I, I think it's a lost opportunity. And maybe that's just me. No, that's beautiful. Very fascinating. I appreciate that. Thank you. Really great. Yeah. Sam? So an easy thing, you know, to do for people who are just kind of getting into this whole um, perception of it. And again, and it's not saying, okay, try this music here, this or that. I always say like three times a day, you know, if you can, if you want to start a really simple music program, start your day with a piece of music that's going to set the intention of where you would like your energy to go during that day. You know, whether it's in a place of gratitude or you just want to be up and, you know, balls to the walls and like you need your up energy. What's that song that's going to start your day for you? And then, you know, as your day progresses, 
like a like lunchtime, you know, this is like musical nutrition. So like lunchtime feeds your feeds you and feeds your body, you know, to reignite your energy. What song can you play in the middle of your day that's gonna either soothe you because you're you're too anxious or you're stressed out or get you up from behind your computer and maybe it's a song to move to and and get up. And then at night, I always think of it, okay, this is a great way to integrate my day. It's kind of like dessert. You know, I want to listen to something sweet and nurturing before I go to sleep to wind down. So I'm not just going from my type A personality, busy state, and trying to get to sleep at night. There's something that kind of bridges me. And, you know, I have a, a ton of music out there that's at, at used for meditation and relaxation, or you can use a piece of classical music or whatever relaxes you. It could be, can't you see, whatever it is, take a moment to wind down at night. And I always tap in a little mindfulness with that as well and say, wow, what were the challenges in my day? You know, what were the things I learned in my day? And try to process like a little bit of my day because a lot of, a lot of sleeping challenges, you know, we have 75 million people in our country alone, you know, who have insomnia. I think a lot of it is because we don't process, you know, our day. And I think music's just a great bridge to allow you to process. Absolutely. People jump straight into bed, brush those teeth, you know, go to the bathroom, just jump into bed and just hope for the best, basically. Yeah. And they might get to sleep, they're not staying asleep, you know. So. Using the computer right before they go to sleep, distracting themselves with their phone right before they go to sleep, thinking about all kinds of things. Yeah. And it's really what? ritual, you know, it's tapping back into the sacredness of that, you know, in shamanistic cultures, you know, music was thought of as a sacred time where, you know, you powerful work could be done in sleep state. So you're, you know, just like you, you want to have an experience where you're going uh, to a, a certain psychedelic experience and you prepare yourself for that experience. You don't just go into it. You know, you're preparing yourself for it. Why are we not doing that going into um, a sacred experience of sleep or preparing ourselves before bedtime. You know, so these are all things, these are ways music can be used in a, a powerful ways to create programs and a ritual of consistency that can change lives. What are some of the more unique or interesting projects that you've been involved with, Barry? That's so exactly the question I was going to ask. That is so cool. That is exactly the question I was <laughs> Exactly. I mean, you know, I've been blessed, Sam. You know, I've um, I just finished a project like with Dr. Daniel Amen, who is one of the pioneers, like in in thinking of the brain as something that we need to look at to be able to diagnose. Just like when we break a, a an arm or a leg, we're taking X rays. He believes we should look at the brain. Um, as opposed to just prescribing across the board. And so we've worked on three or four projects where we're utilizing music to take people to different brain states um, with that. And so that's really interesting. And on the other side of that, I've worked with guys like, you know, Neil Donald Walsh, who, you know, basically wrote a book called Conversations with God about an experience that he had where he began to ask God questions questions and started getting answers. And, um, you know, those books have, are really changed the way people thought about the relationship with God. So I've been lucky to work in very different sides of the spiritual side and the science side, but I don't think they're different. You know, I think there's a bridge between the two. That's really important. And that that's, that's where we're going in our culture now. Look at look at where our culture culture is. And and so what does that collaboration look like when, say, Daniel Amen or Neil Donald Walsh or Joe Dispenza approaches you? I'm assuming they don't, I mean, maybe this is maybe I'm wrong, but I'm assuming they don't have a lot of musical background. So how do they describe what they're looking for and how do you interpret that? And so what does that collaboration look like from the genesis of the project when it's an idea to something that turns, turns into something that they are satisfied enough with to put their name on it and say, this represents what I was, what I look, what I was wanting. 
Yeah, I mean, it's different in all three of those. So, and, and that's, I think that's the whole point, you know, is that it's not a one step process that is going to be the same for everyone. And like Dr. Joe has a, a lot of ideas of what he's looking for in music. And when we were talking about how to listen to music, he knows what resonates with him and what doesn't. But for me, it's always the same, same starting point. I mean, I have an idea of where they might want to go and what they're looking for, but it, I, have to, I have to compose it for me first. And I have to get to the place where I think they're going with it. And, you know, I have to say, yes, wow, that took me there. Like if I'm doing a, a piece of music for a Dr. Joe walking meditation, and I know in that meditation, people are going to be walking into a new energy of the, a new life that they're trying to create. You know, I'm not just like composing it for them. I'm with them. You know, I'm feeling like I'm in that walk when their life's going to change. And I compose around that until I get to that place where, wow, I feel I'm going there. And it's it's the same with, um, you know, with, with Daniel Amen as well. You know, when I'm composing pieces for sleep... Granted, I'm I'm plugging in a lot more research and studies behind in in a situation like that where we're targeting specific heart rates, where we might be using different technologies within that music as well to get people there. But when my wife comes in the room and says, "Wow, this piece of music just makes me feel really grateful," what is this for? And it's like this is this is for Dr. Amon's new CD that I'm working on and it's called thankful music to appreciate life to then I know I've landed on it, you know, and that's really it. It's a combination of sometimes it's, it's applying the research. Sometimes it's applying compositional expertise from composing for the last 40 years, you know, and sometimes it's, it's also putting in technology into it. Um, but I think the secret ingredient in, in all of them that we use through all of those is intention. And it is being aligned emotionally with where I want to go. You know, so that is a big part of the recipe, just like grandma's, you know, grandma's meatballs. You can have that recipe written down, but, you know, it's that love that she's putting into those meatballs. She's seeing her whole family eating those meatballs at Christmas dinner before they eat it. You know, and that's going in. So when her kids try to make that same recipe, right? And it's like, you know, something's missing. I got all the ingredients there. Grandma's missing. Grandma's and her love is is missing in there. So mm. you know, I think it's, it's combining all those things. For me, an, that's my success. You know? It's really interesting interface. This thing about, you know, I, I, again, I really got this time around uh, the return to intention as being a critical central component. But I also got that that seems to be maybe f uh, something to balance, if not flying in the face of this idea of getting out of the way and realizing you're simply a vessel for the creative influence to ride through you. So there's a you there in one that is absolutely responsible for the intention. Yes. You know, you're the one who's going to be make sure that you give your Barry Goldstein's stamp of approval that this is coming from me and works for me. And if I can't do that, you're not going to be able to hear the, the multidimensionality of what I'm producing anyways. So there's a you there, but that same you or something called you, maybe not that same you is also ordered to get out of the way in the world of impro improvising, you know, in the world of creating sounds that are just coming naturally via, via the creator to the population for which you are erased in that uh, that process, that cascade. Uh, is it a balancing act? Are these two different shows? What is this? I was going to say you hit the epitome and the target, you know, right with that, because it's really the combination of those, you know, of, of being able to use everything you've known up until that moment and then throw it out the window because you know what that is and let something else come in with you. So that's what I call a divine, divine collaboration, because I, I don't believe that I'm just stepping out of the way and something is just coming in and composing. You know, I believe, you know, it's, it's a signature of me in this body as well, that I have my own style and my own 
expertise that's been based on my musical experiences and my autobiographical musical experiences that are tied into that. And when those two come in together, where you can throw it out the window, but still utilize it and combine it with something else in collaboration, that to me is when you get into the, into the gumbo, you know, mm. and you come up with something that's like, wow, that felt otherworldly. Or I don't remember every note I played or someone else saying, you know, when I listened to that, I just went someplace else. And I know it's because I went someplace else, you know, at the same time. So I think you really hit it on the head, Fred. I mean, that's really what we strive for is a combination of that and a balance. Yeah. There's also a temporal component that I think is very interesting. Also in a Spotify run a few nights ago, a different night, I believe. Let's see. Somewhere along the line, I got to uh, Whitney Houston. And um, was that after what, the Credence or before? It, <laughs> after Credence. It was after, yeah, after Credence. And um, there was something about her music where I, you know, 635 million hits or something, you know, like, what? what? 600, 635 million hits? Something what, what like that. Fuck? Oh, 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 you hits. I mean, no, that she's been tapped, you know, that, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, whatever that's called, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so I listened to it and I got the value very deeply of who she is or was. You know, I, I got it. I got it, uh, at least for me. But there was a techno, there was something different between, very different between the music that she was creating and the music like Joan Baez was creating or Carol King. Like, like just 30 years earlier, it was a completely different source of beauty. Mm -hmm. Like I could get Houston's source of beauty coming from how pure her voice yes, was. Yes. It almost sounds like a, like a digital instrument. Whereas Baez or Dylan or, right. you know, the folk dudes, they, they're just delivering from the heart. And in fact, massively improvised, not staying on high A for 35 straight seconds. Like, like, you know, like yeah. there, so I guess my question here is there's a temporal component of how these vibrations affect human culture. So that what Whitney Houston may not have been interesting had she showed up in 1962. Right. That's right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, music mirrors what's going on in our society and, and it's a voice, you know, of, of consciousness at the same time. So it's representative of what's going on in our cultures. You know, unfortunately now, well, I won't say unfortunately, it's actually fortunately as well as unfortunately that we, we like when, when I was a kid growing up, radio was how you found all of that. Right. Right. And now we have to kind of search for it. There's right. a lot more of it. So that's what I was going to say, unfortunately, initially, you know, that we can't do it that way. But there's a lot more available at the same time as well. You just can't be lazy, you know, or it's easy to get overwhelmed because there's so much new music out there, you know, and the way to get it is not just have someone, you know, recommend it to you, but you have to search for it as yeah. well. I suppose but the yeah, advantage of that is we're less less likely to be influenced by, say, a record company, say a Sony or a Universal or whatever. They have less sort of a say over what we are supposed to take in and appreciate as the best music out there these days. I mean, is that true? Do the, do the labels have less influence than they used to in terms of kind of curating what we hear and why we're hearing it? I mean, I think it has it has come over to Spotify playlists are pretty much what radio was, you know, you have to get on a, on a playlist just like you had to get on a radio station. But the big change um, that is positive is that, you know, in the time period that we're talking about where Joan Baez or Bob Dylan were around, an artist couldn't compose something in their studio and 24 hours later, it'd be globally distributed. And the whole world has access to it. I mean, I literally could compose a piece of music, upload it on CD Baby, and it could be in iTunes, um, Spotify within a week at the latest. 
you know, so we we don't have to depend on record companies to get our music out there, but they still have the ability to obviously promote it. You right. know, they can um, and they can even I think there's even been some stuff with them buying uh, listens and buying streams on Spotify and that kind of thing. Yeah. I've heard about some really shady stuff going on where they 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 not only promote the music, but they actually somehow buy streams. Yeah, I I don't I don't doubt it. But yeah, at the same time, you know, that guy who's sitting in uh in his place in Kentucky or some place out of the woods where you never would have been able to record. No one had the money to record. You had to do demos, you know, with the big A and R guy with his cigar there judging you, right? You know, now right. now you have the ability our computers come with software that allow you to produce music. So yeah. it's good and bad. There's a lot more of it and there's a lot more to yeah. weed through the not so great stuff as well. But I think that I think overall it's a positive and that, you know, in lots of ways we had the control has come back to the artists in a lot of ways, you know, and the ability to control their own careers. And that you're seeing those so traditions so you know, on YouTube, you know, people who are, you know, Justin Bieber was discovered on YouTube. You know, he wasn't, he didn't go through the same mechanisms we would have 40 or 50 years ago. So yeah. people are making themselves stars. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy to think that, a, you know, what would have been a million dollar recording studio is now pre-installed on your Mac when you buy it these days. Yeah. 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 Barry, we could go on and on. And I do, I have like, a. it's like, oh, one more question. But if I ask that, then I'm going to have two more questions. And if I ask that, I'm going to have four more questions. So at some point I have to like, I have to decide that I don't have any more questions, but I have a million more questions. And it's so curious. You're so interesting. I so appreciate how, uh, how it sounds like we got a little taste of how you got immersed into sound being your, your, you know, medium of this particular incarnation that you get to dance around there and be, you know, muscle up against Joe and Daniel and others who are really making a difference. And actually you get to be the soundtrack or the soundtrack creator or the intention behind some of the work that they're doing that is directly and completely affecting millions each and every day. So that's a deep honor to have a life that is just badass Barry from Brooklyn, who's Bronx. Out here. <laughs> yeah, Bronx, Bronx, excuse me. Uh, you know, who's out here, uh, you know, just cooking up a new, a new uh, tune. And so I truly appreciate the impact and your ability to articulate that, which is, does not lend itself to linear linguistics very easily. And to get your point across inside of using our imaginations to just, uh, you know, take into consideration the nonlinearity of what it is that you're addressing and to do so through the only way we know our music, our like standard music, that of uttering vocality that is just pretty limited in, in, in a lot of ways as our form of communication. But you're brilliant and so articulate. And thank you so much for bringing and for really making my life change as a result of listening to the music of what has come out of your uh, mouth in the last, uh, in the last minute and or hour and 27 minutes. So thank you so <laughs> much for being here. Thank you so much. Well, you guys are yeah. brilliant also. And it was a great conversation and I love not knowing uh, what we were going to talk about. That was the most fun for me. And it's, yeah. you know, it's still about fun for me. That's yeah. the thing that, that hasn't changed for me since I picked up my guitar when I was like 10 years old. Have you ever thought about quadriplegics farting? You know, I actually have, uh, unfortunately. I'm going to see if, if Sam uh, can, can actually we've been incorporate there. You gotta, you, we, We've been there. We've been there on this show. Some, yes. some of that for me in, in a piece of music. So <laughs> I want to actually are... hear Sam play. Um, I want to hear you play guitar, so. I would love maybe, to. Love, maybe next time to. we can have a little jam session live. That's, that's that it. would be Let's great. Do Let's do it, Barry. This has been a real treat. Yeah, so, really. Thank you, man. I appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. I always for appreciate us. you guys and seeing you. And um, thank you for the work and and for feeling so passionate about sharing this in the world and and having me as a guest. So thank you. Indeed. You're welcome. Shana Tova, Barry Goldstein, thanks for being here. Thanks for being exactly who you are. Sam, thanks for being such an awesome dude, like across the board, like the, my favorite guy ever. Likewise, Fred. Thank you. 
and uh group hug yep group, group hug. hug time to roll time to get out there and make some vibrational frequencies uh resonate so let's go make that shit happen well insanity right sam it's like insanity it's like it's like in the midst of sanity is it are, are is there anything sane about what we're doing here, Sam? Is there anything? not at all? But there's, you know, there's such an incredible sort of sanity that I tend to feel after having these great discussions, and this one in particular. There's just so much resonant in this conversation that it helps me to uh, settle down with a increasingly insane world to feel the sanity that does exist. Fabulous, awesome. Well, tuning fork this, and we'll catch you on the backside. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys. Thanks for if you got it. People who hung out for our hour for a whole hour and a half of this one. I mean, that's pretty impressive. I I think it's awesome. I, I hope you had a great time. Talk to you later. Bye for now.